Welcome. Tonight we continue with our study about Jesus Christ being fully God. And so we're going to look at various aspects and we're going to uh, use our knowledge of his attributes and uh, do some good work together. Uh, let's start in prayer. Lord, I just thank you for who you are. Thank you that you provide everything we ever need and you fulfill us in the deepest place we possibly could need. Please use tonight to pour yourself into us. Open our eyes and our, of our heart, our minds and our emotions. Please let us engage, engage with the material and learn of you. Reveal yourself so we can be transformed to your glorious, wonderful self. We don't want to stay the same. So we invite you here, Holy Spirit, do a mighty work in us. We thank you for that. Amen. Uh, the gals here already know that I get to be humble before you because I forgot my reading contact and my reading glasses for my old eyes, and I had a broken one in the car. So <laughs> in order for me to read to you tonight, we will have to do this. So, <laughs> you'll see how cute I look in broken black sunglasses. I haven't used these and I don't know. I mean, I just picked them up at probably Dollar Tree. <laughs> They're better at Walmart, but anyway, so I get another ones now. Um, all right. One of the things we're going to do, we're going to look at attributes. And so instead of opening your book, we're going to just do work. And so you at home also. We don't need to open Dr. Grudem's book. Um, we'll give you some attributes and we're going to do some work. Before we get there, one of the things I want to mention to you that we've talked a lot is we've discussed Jesus Christ being fully man, fully God, in one body forever. One of the things that keeps coming up are the different miracles. And was this a miracle done from his deity, or is this a miracle done as a human being under the control of the Spirit? And I haven't been clear and in conversation about it and thought about it. Research, I think I've come up with what I think is possibly the best explanation I know of. And that is, if the miracle is something you see other people do, or God, or in the scriptures it's listed that the apostles could do, or you see someone else do it, for example, Peter walking on the water, that has to be done by a human being with God enabling. So there are some that we can consider from his out of his humanity, in submission to the Spirit, in obedience to the Father, that he is able to do them. But there are others that are clearly something that we never see anyone else do. Um, actually controlling the waves and the wind, like that with a spoken word. If you notice, and, and Dr. Grudem expands on some of this, but he said they didn't go wow, this man really knows God. They did, and they said, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? So, and they worshiped. So a lot of times in different things they worship, they, they don't acknowledge it to a man. They say, wow, God is in you. So I, that's sort of how I'm looking at it, because we're going to be looking at omnipotence. We're going to be thinking about his miracles. And so see if this doesn't help it fit a little better for you. Um, as we look at them. So what we're going to do is I'm going to list some of the attributes and if you've done attributes with us then you are more, you're more aware of them. If you have Dr. Grudem's book you can look it up or you can go online to www.impact with an M, impactparenting.com and then uh, look up attributes or definition of attributes and they'll have them listed there or a lot of you have them with you if you don't know them. And we're going to list the attributes. We'll stop the camera. And then you all are going to discuss with your neighbors if you can think of scripture with it or find scripture, write the scripture down. If not, an example. For example, calming the water, calming the storm, feeding the people, whatever it is your, your example. When Jesus said this, when he said this, um, <clears throat> you don't have to worry about the scripture as much if you can just go, well, I don't know where he said it, but when he said this, he's proving this, this attribute. Because these are incommunicable attributes. 
which means that we can't have them, basically. These are only God's attributes, not ones that communicate to us. Um, some of them, there's some little bit of it, but for example, when we study um, wisdom, we can have his wisdom. He offers himself as wisdom to us. We can become wiser and wiser. So that's a communicable attribute. So that he can communicate that to us spiritually, that we can become more and more. But the ones on the list we don't have. And so they are exclusively God. Therefore, anyone operating these would have a claim to deity. So uh, let me write these down. I'm not going for you earlier, but I was looking for my glasses. Uh, independence. I'm just saying independence, or another word for that is self-existent. And if you want to, existent. If you want to, you can uh, use your electronic device and look them up to look up some of your verses. Unchangeable, immutable. Are we changeable? Yes. Are we women changeable? Yes. Yeah. We're more changeable than the Oklahoma weather. Uh, Eternal, um, or immortal. So it, eternal in the fact that it's both directions, okay? Because we will live eternally, but we haven't always lived eternally. So that's what we mean by this eternal. Or immortal is another um, word. Glory, or worthy of, worth, worthy of worship. And, okay, because I kind of put immortality here. So, immortality. All right, and so look up these definitions. And actually, let me see if I am here. I'll read your, our definitions that we came up with. If you don't know and you'd like to learn more on our channel on YouTube, is are all the um these and more that we studied last semester. So eternal or independent, I mean independent or self-existent is God does not need us or the rest of creation for anything. And then it continues, but that's the point. And the creature always needs something. So independent and self-existent, he is existent unto himself and he needs nothing else. Unchangeable is God is unchanging in every way, his persons, perfections, purposes, and promises. Eternal or immortal, God has no beginning and no succession of moments in his own being, and he sees all time equally vividly. So there's, he never stops. Uh, if you do geometry, it's a line with infinite arrows going both directions. And then glory is the infinite beauty and worth of God, and certain that to be worthy of worship, we'll include it in that. All right, so if you need them, you look them up online. And so we're going to stop the camera, and y'all are going to stop and work with your neighbors. About half of you start this at the bottom, and the other half, you start at the top, and you all start, start at the bottom, so that we can not just front load all the information. All right, so look up verses, look up, write down ideas, or examples of when you saw, you see any of these attributes that you can think of applied to Jesus in the New Testament. Seven, sorry. <laughs> I hope you had a good conversation. Now we're going to hear what the ladies hear. Let's begin with independent or self-existent. Um, I've given up my definition, so someone read the definition, just the first part. God does not need us or the rest of creation for anything, yet we... There, that's okay. Let's read something. God doesn't need us or the rest of creation for anything. So when we talked about this is the contrast between creator and creature. And so creator doesn't need anything. He is self-existent on his own, totally satisfied, totally fulfilled, without any needs or wants, in contrast to us. So that's self-existent, independent. So what did you get about Jesus? Because only God can be this. And if we can find ways that Jesus was shown to be independent or self-existent, then it proves that he is God. What did you come up with? His conception. Mm. 
Mm. Okay, how is that? Well, he didn't need man and woman to unite to be conceived. What was unique? But I don't know if it shows self-existent, because self-existent means you always are, if you will, and don't have any need, and he needed a mother's womb. So uh, there are aspects. It was unique, and he did need a father. Um, but I don't can, I don't see that would be under self-existent. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? Do you, can you argue with me? Because that's what I see. I see he. This is a human being. His is there that the human being needed a mother, needed blood, needed her to eat food, needed. A placenta. He needed all of that. Mm -hmm. Unique, yes. But I don't think that actually exhibits his self-existence. Okay, what else? What about John 14, 6, for the way the truth to your life? No one comes to the Father but by me. Okay, how's that? Well, I mean, Thank you. independently is the only way. <laughs> I mean, there is no other. I am his way, truth, and life. That's pretty, not needing of anything else. And he has it for others. And there's a pattern here that he has life to give to others. So self-existence means having life within yourself. And the creation doesn't have life within itself, in contrast to what um, macroevolutionists say. Macroevolutionists would suggest that the creation has life within itself. So anywhere you see life, that he has life, he gives life, he creates life, only a self-existent one has life to be able to do that. Good. Now there's, I know you did a lot of work, so let me, I need to use my ink up. John 1, 1, 3, 3. John 1, 1, 1 3, 3, 3, okay, how's that? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Okay, so how is that self-existent? He made everything. He was already there. Well, it kind of says he's God. And he was in the beginning. And that's, that's eternal also. I mean, the that's right. world. Yeah. Very good. What else did y'all come up with? Ideas or suggestions? I was also thinking... Um, well, I looked at the verses in Matthew, but um, leading up to the crucifixion when Peter cuts the ear off and he pretty much says, I don't need you. This is God's plan. He doesn't say, I don't need you, but he said, this is God's plan. And that happened previously when he says, get behind me, Satan. You don't know the plans of the Father, or however that's worded. But a couple of times through scripture, he pretty much tells his disciples, you aren't going to help my plan along. It's going to go on. You know, anyway. So I agree. Okay. Under the broad category, he repeatedly showed he didn't have any needs. Now, the human being part of him did. But there, then he says, uh, I got, no, you can't tweet this, you can't do this. I've got it. Good. Other ideas? Independent, but it definitely makes him God. Right. right. So I'm not sure if we put this under self existent or independent, but since only the one who is God, who doesn't have sin, has the right to forgive sin. So it's really good. This is a perfect example, and we'll just put it under here. Because that's an excellent example. Well, you're doing good work. What about the rest of you that are being quiet? We didn't get to that one. We only did the they other the end. Yeah. You didn't do Oh, you're just at the other end. Okay. Um, Y'all don't have some more. I have a few. Somebody look up John uh, 10 30. Somebody, did we do John 5? Okay. John 5. We'll go there as a group. Uh, what about John? Well, let's look at these. 
Okay, let's go to John 5 first. Christians, and we go, wow, it sure makes a good case if Jesus really is God, and we're trying to do something. Let's look at his direct enemies who hated him and would have done anything to bring him down. Look in uh, verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking the more to kill him. Not because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself what? Equal with God. So there is no doubt. They were not confused at all. They saw so clearly what he was doing. So we have his enemies supporting our case right here in Scripture. Um, let's see, 25, 20. Lord, I sure appreciate glasses. Uh, 21. Sure. Uh-huh. So that's... See, I guess I read it like they're just saying, and he's claiming himself to be equal to God. Yes. But they're not saying he is equal to God. No. Yeah. But they, they, it's, people sometimes say that we Christians are reading something in mm -hmm. that's not really there. And so when his enemies go, oh, he just said I am? Uh -huh. We're going to stone him because this is blasphemy. He's saying he's God. Because it doesn't have the impact on us if we don't understand what I am means. Yeah. Okay? Just like if these people heard the, us talk about tweeting something, yeah. they'd look it up in a dictionary and they go, are they birds? Mm -hmm. So the same with this. When yeah. they're getting it, they don't agree with it. Yeah. But it's clear as clear can be to them. He continues to, to say he is God. Okay. Uh, 21, so John 5, 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Only the self-existent one has the quality of life that can be given to another. Creatures can't do that. We uh, kind of get supporting verse, Cheryl. Pardon? Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Yeah, read it to us. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That sounds like an self-existent God. So excellent. Yes, I think I even have that verse down here. Uh, yeah, I did. I have it later on, further on. Um, let's see, 25. Truly, truly. What did we say last week whenever Jesus says truly, truly? Listen up, this is really important. I'm only going to say it once. Well, no, I'm not. I'm going to say it twice. Truly, truly. So listen. <laughs> I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So again, he's giving life to others which only a self-existent God has the quality of creative life within him. 26. For as the Father has life in himself and has granted the Son also to have life in himself. 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Over and over and over. He has the ability to give life. Eternal life and physical life. Creation can't do it. That's where the macroevolutions are wrong. Because creation can't create life. Only the creator. 
Only the independent, self-existent God has that form of life, quality of life. It's a different word than what we have in the way of life. Thoughts? John 5, uh, 8, 58, we looked at last week. I believe it's I am. We've talked about that some again. Uh, 858? Okay. I am. That's self-existent. I am self-existent. I need nothing outside. I exist based on the fact of who I am and nothing else. I also put that one under eternal too. What? I also put that one under eternal also. Yes. Then we found out, the more we studied attributes, what did we find out? They're all each other. They're all slop all over each other. They don't have the dividing lines. Um, John 10 talks about giving life several times. John 10.30, he says, I am the Father of One. So whatever the self-existent Father, but that's just an overarching one. He's, again, they're going, he's claiming to be God. So whatever is true of God is true of the Son. Anybody else over here? Because y'all studied it. Do y'all have anything else to give to it? Uh, is it John 11.25 when he says, I am the resurrection and the life? John 11.25. Remember we talked last week. If you want to study just more about Jesus, just read John. It's just Jesus, 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 over and over and over. 11.21? <coughs> 25. 25. All right, so there we have just, in a short study, we already have evidence from Scripture to say Jesus is the self-existent one. <coughs> Life within himself and the ability to create life, the ability to give life, and he needs nothing. Our second one, unchangeable. I'm going to all right, get this down because I'm going to erase it and then I'm going to. You got it? Okay, let's do unchangeable. Yes? Um, Hebrews 13 8. <laughs> It's a real wishy-washy one, isn't it? Okay, read it to us. Um, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, and today, and forever. There we go. It's like in Malachi. I am Lord, I do not change. New Testament, I am the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. 13, 5? 13, 8. I mean, boom! Not wishy-washy at all. What else on Unchangeable? Anything else? Oh, lots. Okay, give us some. <laughs> the temptations, the Garden of Gethsemane, choosing his disciples, all of his preaching. And then we got into the second part of different responses to different situations, how that is unchangeableness. And that... Okay, so let me read our definition of what we're dealing with. Um, unchanging, he's unchanging in every way. His person, perfections purposes and promise. Now when we say his person, we don't mean his physical body. We mean his being. That he will always be self-existent. He will always be holy. He will always... So we're talking that that's his um, being. Okay, what else did you get with unchanging? Well, we started with like the water to wine, okay? And that, that it didn't change his timing and obedience to the Father but yet he was honored and obeying his mother. Wow. And so then we, that really got us thinking about the different responses to different situations, and wow, there's a lot there. Yes. I could think about that for a long time. The interesting thing, because the second half of the definition of unchanging is fabulous. You should need to go back. I think we spent four weeks on unchanging. It will change you. If you haven't done it, you need to do unchanging. Don't do anything else. Well, you have to implement it too, but, <laughs> but do unchanging on YouTube. Okay, God is unchanging in every way. His person, perfections, purposes, and promises. Same with Jesus. Yet, God does act and feel emotion, and he acts and feels differently in response to different situations. And so this was something we spent a long time to understand it sounds like he changes his mind sometimes, the way the wording is. And so we really looked and hashed at that. And then what's interesting about Jesus is he did respond differently almost every time. Yeah. 
Think of the way he healed people that were blind. Boom, you're healed. Touch you. Put mud. Go wash. Do this. Spit. He did all kinds of things. Don't tell things. anybody. Go tell people. Come with me. Go home. I'm going to come. But I don't need to come. was his unchangeableness because it's the same purpose to glorify God. So his person, perfections, promises, and whatever the fourth one is. Okay? Those don't change, but the method changed. What are we really hung up a lot of times in church with Christianity is method. Well, I don't like, that's too long, that's too short, that's too light, that's too dark, that's too loud, that's too quiet, Chair that's her. too formal, that's too casual. Yeah. <laughs> and so methods bother us, and I think that's why Jesus did it. To show it's not about the method, it's the Messiah that matters. Okay, excellent. Any other thoughts about unchanging? We talked about his temptations too, and just how he did feel them, but the purpose was unchanging, kind of what you were just saying, that he he knew what his father's plans and purposes were, and so he, he felt the temptations and went through them, but... Speak up so we should sure pick you up on there. Okay, yes. All right, again, all the different ways that he did things in a different way, the, our four Ps, um, his perfections, purposes, promises, and person never change in all of it. That is so perfectly <laughs> consistent. No human being could do that. And now the human being side of it, we're places where the human being of Jesus did change. The Garden of Gethsemane. He wa wanted the cup to be taken from him. Where, what else? Were there places where he wasn't tired? Were there places he was tired? Were there places that he ate? Places he didn't eat? Places that he was thirsty? And so forth. So there we can see different things in the way the human being had body needs and so forth that changed. But it wasn't the four Ps we're talking about. <clears throat> Again, it was more style. And it was just his physical body. There were times he woke up and he's going, great. Did he always walk on the water? No. But So he did different things. He mixed it up. So it's okay to mix things up. You just have to make sure that what you're doing is listening to the Father and obedience to the Spirit. Anything else on unchanging? Um, I found a website when I was looking on my Google, and it was actually really interesting, and it just talked about being the same, and I liked it referenced how Jesus was the same by his word, like what he said from his promises to everybody never changed. He was the same on his love, the way he loved people. Um, he was the same in his person, like his perfections, and I was like, oh my gosh, like that's God, you know? So it was a really good little, um, you said something else. His purpose is his... Um, his word, his love, his love. and his person, right. and stuff like that. So I was like, those are really good points. Just seeing his character, like his love never changed. And if his love, I mean, was unchanging, it's God, because only God, and, and a, I and mean, only a human body that is God could love like And him. though some of this could be a human being under the control of the Holy Spirit, in obedience to the Father, these could be true of a human being who was in total control by the Spirit. This stuff can't be. Okay? This simply can't be. And the consistency of it, to a degree, it could be a human being. We could, could, we could have that. When we're under the Spirit, listening to the Father, being obedient, um have mature character, and so forth, some of this. So let's be a little careful with this. Um, but, you know, we go to the Old Testament, I've loved you, the everlasting love. Okay, that love is what he demonstrated, but also a human being could have shown some of the love that he showed, the compassion, the mercy, all of that, that's a fruit of the Spirit. So a little bit, some of this might, we have to be careful because some of it might be applied to fruit of the Spirit uh, for someone who's perfectly trans 
perfectly in the spirit. No. Can't be so we can't be unchanging in this. And he clearly was, but some of it could be just because of being obedient to the Spirit, obedient to the Father, and submissive to the Spirit. Excellent. I just want to be careful, the ones that we have to go, let's be, oh, be careful of that. All right, what else? Anything is out? Anything else? So the, the verse is actually Hebrews 13, 8, that says, I am the same yesterday, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Hebrews 13, 5, that you have up there is, uh, uh, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Oh, that's true. So, so, see, because I love that verse. That's why I wrote a five when you told me eight. Sorry. But, yes. in a way, that's kind of unchangeable in and of itself because it's a promise that he's made, never will I leave you, never will so I forsake you. So, we can do you. this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I mean, Hebrews 13 just kind of nails it real easily. Anything else? All right, let's look at eternal. What do you all have with eternal? Okay, in eternal, our definition is God has no beginning or succession of moments in his own being, and he sees all time equally vividly. Okay, succession of moments is our definition of time. And even when we're in eternity, when the time is over and it's past revelation, and we're in the New Jerusalem, and it's going to be forever, we will still exist one moment after the next. We will feel and experience life a succession of moments. And I get that. We kind of conclude that from one particular scripture where it says, um, in the New Jerusalem, by the water were trees, and they gave their fruit in season. So it has the idea that there's continuous time. Time will continue. It will continue for us. But it doesn't for him. The God of Jesus. Jesus Christ, did he experience succession of moments? I mean, the human being. Yes. Do you have any scriptures where he is eternal? I think the John 1-1 one, one goes with both eternal and the independence. They're pretty linked, aren't they? Y'all had one over here a while ago. Somebody did. Hebrews 13.8 goes with it. I understand you should stay in forever. Hebrews 13.8 pretty nails it. Right? Jesus Christ is saying today, yesterday, forever, two days ago, ten millions. Well, there is no time before Genesis, but pre-time and forever and ever and ever. The same? Another John 8, 58, one? The truly, truly one. Which one? John 8.58. The truly, truly. And it says what? I am, before Abraham was, I am. They knew it. So they picked up stones to kill, or this time they just wanted to kill him. BFW verses, John 1, 3, mm -hmm. 10, 17, 24. <laughs> BFW. Yeah, we were like, ah, oh, the book of John. Yeah, pretty much the book of John. Also, Colossians, we had the Colossians verse one ago. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Mm -hmm. 17. That whole chunk of Colossians. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1 is kind of like John 1. Mm -hmm. Revelations, Alpha and Omega. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's in uh, 18, no, 1 8. In 22 13. This, I think, is God the Father. Yeah. <coughs> is this God the Father? 22 to what? 13. I think this one is actually a reference to God the Father. Well, 117 <coughs> is, I am the first and the last. Mm -hmm. 117? Revelation of the 117. <coughs> so it's very clear. Again, he's eternal. All of us had a birthday. So Jesus Christ the man had a birthday. But Jesus Christ the God... Jesus Christ. <coughs> Never had a birthday. He longed to gather Jerusalem under his wing, but that represented <coughs> eternal because it was a long time he'd wanted to do that, but they wouldn't have it. <coughs> Wings. Yep. Hebrews 7 and 8 talks about him being a priest forever. Mm -hmm. Good. <coughs> 
It's all over, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And if we really extrapolate it, oh, thank you very much. I'll swallow it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, anything else on this? We said the temple would be torn apart, he'd raise it again in three days. And they thought they meant the physical temple, but he meant his body. Well, how's that eternal? Because he's alive again. I'm just trying to think of it directly as eternal. I would go, that's back to life. No beginning, no end. Because it's, you know, it gets real messy. This life thing about the self-existent one with life, because it says, uh, in Colossians, other place, that he oversees, uh, John and Colossians, he oversees nothing's made without him, and that he is the creator of life which means somehow he oversaw his own creation and development and then about his resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. It says that Jesus Christ did his own resurrection. Mm -hmm. The Father did it, but it also says scripture. So this is the dual duality of the two natures. That he, he in his godliness, I mean his Divine nature can oversee what's going on in the human nature. Yeah, and I can't explain it any better than that. <laughs> we had written down under eternal just the fact that he, he did his own resurrection. I mean, that's, yeah. that's an eternal. Yeah. So. Resurrection. Good. What about um, end times prophecy that he made and, and Matthew and Luke and then also, whenever he quoted prophecy about himself that was fulfilled, would those fall under eternal? And that he, I mean, obviously, even the, the stuff that used the, the Old Testament prophecies, people could have known because they, those were written down and they studied those. But then, whenever he made prophecy about, okay, here's what, you know, signs of the time. Well, he said, this is being fulfilled stuff. right now. What was said of the prophet? Yeah. Yes. That's, and he yeah. said it repeatedly. Yes. Okay. I mean, like we. Like his reference to Abraham, yeah. and then he goes, "Okay, this is it. That prophecy is being fulfilled now." Yeah. But then you could say, "Well, yeah, but there were prophecies about John, like make mm -hmm. wait straight, and he wasn't existent then." Mm -hmm. So I'm just being picky, trying to make sure yeah. if that's actually unchanging, or eternal, or eternal, or eternal. eternal. What, so. What about um, second? Uh, it's the only one I don't have memorized. What is it? <laughs> I mean, it gets her prescriptions off. <laughs> but it's now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Immortality is pretty eternal, isn't it? And we were saying I immortal. Oh, no one can take my life from me. That's immortal. Can people take our lives? A little tiny virus can take our lives. He says, I lay my life down. Nobody can take it from me. That's immortal. We even thought, well, the fact that he so often said, my father, so that was equating himself as the son of God and, and putting himself on the same level of God who is eternal. Right. Who is all of us? Yes. The immortal, invisible, the only wise God, somewhere in there, in one of the T letters, I think. Immortal. But that's somewhere in there. It actually says immortal, which is pretty um, immortal. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, let's look at some others. Uh, Carol would just put an entire wall up. We could keep all this of uh, whiteboards, you know. But she has like a flip thing here, and it flips, and we got smart boards, and we can all connect all of our electronic things to it. That would be cool. I'm taking up a collection. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be here when you tell Monty. <laughs> uh, all right, what about omnipresent? So the omnis. Okay, omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient. So omnipotent, 
he's all powerful. Uh, omniscient, he's all knowing. And omnipresent, he's all present. And so the one that's the hardest for us to grasp is all present, uh, omnipresent. And so we go, there is no spot that God is not. There is nowhere we can be that all of God is not completely there. So that's sort of our expansion of all present. There's no place, there's nowhere we can be that all of God is not completely there. Because this is not physical, this is on a different level than just the physical. All right, so what do you have on some of the omnis? We didn't do those. They we didn't the do list. those. We did glory. We didn't do omnis? You didn't have mm -hmm. enough there. We didn't have time. Did y'all do omnis? Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's start did. doing some. Let's, <laughs> let's think off the top of your head. What are some omnis? Where can you think of him being omnipresent? Right. The problem with omnipresent, what's going to be the problem here? He's limited to physical. Because the human being is only present. Mm -hmm. In heaven right now, Jesus Christ is one place. And he has a physical body like this that we can touch. And he can't be everywhere all at once. But the deity of Jesus Christ can be everywhere. And is everywhere. But remember, it's not a physical thing like you and I. He's not limited to physical reality. There is no place that all of God is not completely there. So I'm just thinking... I didn't write any verses down. I thought y'all were going to get it. What's the verse where, uh, is it Jairus sends his servant because the daughter is dying and he just mm -hmm. basically says she's healed and he never physically goes okay. to the child? Yes. That's good. <clears throat> Jairus' daughter, he doesn't have to go somewhere to do it, does he? Mm -hmm. What else? How do you know when that is him versus when that crosses over into the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. The only thing, because that's what we talked about. I think what, where the best place to explain it, the most best explanation <laughs> for me, is if it's something like this. Because see... An apostle could say what's well, going to happen. And he could, I don't know, I don't know if there's any healing. They said the people that touched Paul's handkerchief were healed. Mm -hmm. So there can be off location healing from a human being. Mm -hmm. That's not God. So we're just, I don't know, just thinking about it. That's it. Can, is it something that we know a human being can do? Like walking on the water. Okay, surely Jesus' walking on the water is different from Peter's walking on the water. However, Peter could walk on the water. So that's something a human being can do in obedience and in, empowered by the Spirit. So we can't use that only, but what else? Good. I would agree with you. Where you saw Felton and said, oh, I saw you before you ever came. Yes. I don't know of a place where a human being could see something that wasn't within their sight. It was the centurion's daughter, not Jairus' daughter. No. And see, I don't know. But, but I just, I got it. I got the person wrong. So. Okay, so but the story is still the same. Okay, so if somebody got healed off site, mm -hmm. probably done to show his omnipresence. How about his omnipotence? What's something we can say for his omnipotence? Again, he knew his entire life how he would die. So be omniscience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming he even knew the exact time and, you know how like sometimes we know we're going to do something. Oh, he did. I mean, he goes, it's time to go up to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. And then he would say, oh, you don't know. This is, I'm just going to be here with you. I mean, he very much, that last, again, we go back to John, the last four or five chapters of John, he um, was predicting what was getting ready to happen. Mm -hmm. And then there are other places where he predicted, he was predicting the type of death he would have. 
So that shows his omniscience. Mm. Did he know, so I was thinking too of him knowing about like Peter's betrayal and mm -hmm. like, at what mission. point did he know all of that though or was it revealed to him it doesn't say on? in scripture now his death and the fulfillment of scripture um, those types of things um, that's all through the New Testament but we don't know mm -hmm. but again those are the things that we never see a human being doing nor does it suggest that a human being can see through they're prophetic things, but nothing like what we see in him. Also the woman at the well. We should, I should have remembered that from yesterday. Mm -hmm. The woman at the well, <clears throat> he knew all about her. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. In fact, if you read it well, it looks like it suggested that Jesus you know, intentionally was there at the time to meet her. So he even knew she was coming, not only when she showed up. So a lot of omniscience there. Um, Omnipotence when he calmed the storm. And they went, wow. They didn't go, oh, this man, show us your tricks. Mm -hmm. Like if you think <coughs> in Acts when the sorcerer said, show me how to do this. I want this gift of the Spirit because I want to be able to do these tricky things. Mm -hmm. They didn't. They worshipped him. Okay. So I think. What else? Can you think of omnipresence? And there are places like after his resurrection where he showed up and disappeared, but there are other places. Like Philip down there with the eunuch and so forth, and suddenly he was back in um, Jerusalem or wherever he went back to. And then also the one of the two ones in the boat. I think it's one where he walked on the water it says at the end, and suddenly they were at the other side, where they had spent all night, and they were still, and they couldn't get across, and suddenly they're on the other side. Mm -hmm. Just, That's right. Mm -hmm. So, the fact that Jesus could suddenly show up or be gone, we see other examples. Um, um, the feeding the two multitudes would be omnipotent. I can't think of an example where other people did that. So omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. Anything else? Can you think of some more examples? Another omniscient one is when they're going into Jerusalem and he tells the disciples to go ahead and get the donkey. Or the donkey? The and oh, yeah. It's loaded. Yeah. <clears throat> Those last couple of days, it's absolutely. I mean... Turning to, and just rister, one thing after another, yeah, rister, turning to incredible. Judas and saying, go do what you have to do, do it quickly. Mm -hmm. He already knew, and it says, and they chose, he chose J Judas knowing he was going to betray him. So he knew the whole time. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Look at this, all through scripture. And so some of these, and there's so many more. When we have the omnis, but just touching on those. And anywhere that you can find in the New Testament where he's worthy of worship or glory. Oh, yeah. But only God has. Because who is the only one worthy of glory? God. God. And where do we mess up all the time? What are we trying to do? Worship other things all the time. I'm all about worshiping. Okay, so worthy of worship. Worthy of worship or glory? Okay. Somebody tell me John 1. And we beheld him. What else does it say in John 1? The glory of the one and only. We beheld his glory of the Father. Okay. Anything else you can think of glory? Place where it Baptism. talks about he's to be worshipped. Places where his glory is revealed. Baptism. The baptism? Transfiguration. Temptation. Walking on the water. You're just kind of pulling them all together. Oh, but there's so many. We yeah. listed them. Conception. Race from Anybody the dead. Anybody think of anything in Philippians that talks about his worthy of worship? Uh, John 17, 1 through 5 talks about him asking God to glorify him. Yes. Is it 17, 5? 
Where he says, Father, I can hardly wait to be and share with you the glory which I had shared with you before the foundation of the world. So it's glory and eternal. Because mm -hmm. BFW talks about before the foundation of the world. All the I am's. All the I am's. Anybody think anything in Philippians? Like maybe in Philippians 2. <laughs> talks about his being worthy of worship. Every this? knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is Lord. Therefore, he is highly exalted. Given the name above all names. In the name of Jesus. Okay? Everyone will bow and worship him. That Philippians 2. What else? Can you think of any other places? That's in Matthew 25, 31, where he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory. Say it again. Say it a little louder. It says, When the Son of Man comes, he's talking about the losing back. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, that he will sit on his glorious throne. Glory, 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 glory. How about um, he was silent at the trial? No. And 40 days after the resurrection, Wait. he was walking around with people. And how is that glory, glory and worship worthy of worship? I think he was ministering to people then. People were worshiping him. He wasn't dead anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and the ascension? Yeah, ascensions. A lot of people do ascensions. No. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if that's... Well, I, mean, I don't know what it is, so we'll put it here. I think it's Proves glory. he was God, though. Yeah. There's the time when in Acts when Stephen was being stoned. And what happened there? Uh, he looked up and saw Jesus standing under a hand of Good. That's right. Stephen's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Top tier. We thought about the ten lepers, how he was unhappy that only one of them came back to thank him. So, so he he's thinking he's worthy of to be glorified then. Yeah. Oh. Everybody think, think, think. What else? Well, uh, when what Susie was saying as far as after the resurrection and he appears and then Thomas says, My Lord and my God, and he doesn't That's deny true. that any okay. acts and when Thomas fell down at his feet. And of course Revelation declares over and over and over worthy are you over and over and over. So there's lots of Jesus in Revelation where he's worthy of worship, being worthy, all of those. And then there are a lot of them called the benedictions, like 224. Mm. Um, there are a lot of them when they say, talk about, oh, is it Paul, or just they suddenly burst into worship of him after they're talking about him. Do you have some more ideas? I mm. took the part worthy of worship, and this didn't have glory in it, but it describes, I would think this would be something to work for someone, but I am the resurrection, the life, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I mean, that's someone to be worshipped. And that is John? That would be um, John 11, 25. And see, what well, we're still having trouble with some of these, because they're all overlapping a lot. Wow. Excellent. Okay, don't quit doing this. Watch for this. You want something to read? Read the New Testament looking for evidence of Jesus being God. And you just read it and you just mark it. So there are all kinds of things. Keep your, um, get out the list. And as you come across it, go, oh, here's another place. He's, here's another, here's another, here's another. So if you're looking for things to do in your quiet time, in your time alone with Jesus, this is a good Bible study to follow up on. All right. Now what we're going to do, does anybody else have anything else they want to share? We're going to check out Dr. Grudem and see how he agrees with us. Mm -hmm. Who's going to say something? I say we, we talked about on the glory too, just that sometimes it's not something that happened right then. For instance... You read John 14 through 16, which was all after the Last <coughs> Supper and all the things he was telling them. And that's that's something, yeah, all, and, and they didn't understand at the time all that stuff that he was talking about, I'm sure. But then looking back, then once they could see it was fulfilled, and so much of that is about the Holy Spirit, 
and for them to then understand and that that you know sometimes he, we see he, we, there's things that he we don't always fully understand but then later whenever they come to pass or we understand him it's like oh wow he already he well, they already say told it me over and over that. and over yes. and then later they yes. realized uh had one to sin he used a word that had never been used in the bible ever when he said, upon this rock I build my church. If you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he said, upon this rock I will build my church. He said the word church. No one else had done it. So he knew about the church. That's omniscience. Because nobody else, there was no teaching about it. It was nothing. It was a mystery. It was hidden. And that's the first time it popped up. So, oh, so consider doing that for a Bible study. All right, so let's turn with my cute glasses. Um, and I don't have the page. It's evidence that Jesus possessed the attributes of deity. 547. What is it? 547. 547. You know, it could be, you know, because this is going like on a YouTube video. This might like go viral and be the next thing on Pinterest and just... <laughs> <laughs> people start breaking off their hipster glasses and only having one ear piece. Who knows? That's what this is. This is really cool. That's why I'm doing it. All right. Let's go. So we're going to read together now out of uh, Dr. Grudem's book and see what he says. This is from Systematic Theology. Everybody have a look if you don't have someone share with them. Evidence that Jesus possessed the attributes of deity. In addition to the specific affirmations of Jesus' deity that we just read last week in all the different passages, uh, Jesus demonstrated these attributes. Omnipotence. When he stilled the storm at sea with the word in Matthew 8, multiplied the loaves and fishes in Matthew 14, changed the water to wine in John 2. Some might object that these miracles just showed the power of the Holy Spirit working through him. <clears throat> just as the Holy Spirit could work through any other human being, and therefore these do not demonstrate Jesus' own deity. But the contextual, that means the context and the way it's done, explanation of these events often point not to what they demonstrate about the power of the Spirit, but to what they demonstrate about Jesus himself. So it's... Um, when you read what it talks about, like the the disciples not going, wow, these are really amazing man to be able to do this in the power of the Spirit. They, instead, they were blown away. Who is this that can control the weather with one word? So that's saying in the context, it's again, what are they really thinking and where's the focus? Um, For instance, after Jesus turned the water to wine, wine, John tells us this is the first of his miraculous signs that Jesus did in Cain of Galilee and manifested his glory. So the context there tells us this wasn't just something anyone could do. He was manifesting the glory of God when he did it. And his disciples believed in him. So they wouldn't have believed in him as a really great man who could do amazing things. They believed in him as God. It was not the glory of the Holy Spirit that was being manifested, but the glory of Jesus himself as his divine power worked to change water to wine. Similarly, after Jesus stilled the storm at the Sea of Galilee, the disciples didn't say, Wow, how great is the power of the Holy Spirit working through this prophet? But instead, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey? In Matthew 8, it was the authority of Jesus himself to which the winds and the wave were subject. And this could only be the authority of God, who rules over seas and has power to still the waves. And he gives three references in Psalms to prove that God has the ability, as the creator and as omnipotent God, to control seas and waves. Jesus asserts his eternity when he says, John 8, 58, before Abraham I was, uh, before Abraham I am, and we've already talked about that previously, or I am the Alpha and Omega in Revelation 22, 13. See how good you all are? You, 
I think Dr. Grudem needs your help. <laughs> the omniscience of Jesus is demonstrated in his knowing people's thoughts, Mark 2.8, and seeing Nathaniel in the fig tree from old oh, Nathaniel, not Philip. Uh, under the fig tree far away in John 1.48, and knowing from the first those who did not who that did not believe and who it was that would betray him, John 6.64. Of course, the revelation of individual, specific events or facts is something that God could give to anyone who has a gift of prophecy in the Old or New Testaments. But Jesus' knowledge was much more extensive than that. He knew who those were that did not believe, thus implying that he knew the belief or unbelief that was in the heart of men. And in fact, John says explicitly in 2.25, he knew all men and needed no one to bear witness of man. So he can read people's hearts. And a man can't do that. It's only God can really believe their heart. We might have discernment, but we can't believe their hearts. The disciple could later say to him, Now we know that you know all things, John 16, 30. These statements say much more than could be said of a great prophet or an apostle of the Old Testament or New Testament for they imply omniscience on the part of Jesus. Finally, after his resurrection, when Jesus asked Peter if he loved him, Peter answered, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you, John 21, 17. Here Peter's saying much more than that Jesus knows his heart and knows that he loves him. He's rather making a general statement, you know everything. And from that, he's drawing a specific conclusion and an example of that, you're knowing everything, is you know that I love you. Peter is confident that Jesus knows what's in the heart of every person, and therefore he is sure that Jesus knows his heart. Ladies, this applies to you. Jesus knows your heart. So it does matter what your motivation is and your desire, even if it all flubs completely. And it doesn't turn out remotely like you thought it should or what you wanted to. Jesus cares about your heart. So it's what's in your heart that matters to him. So whether you're the biggest success at anything, if your heart isn't right, that's what Jesus cares about. And if your heart's right, what happens does not matter. Because it's all about him. So remember, he knows this. He knows your motivations. That's an encouragement, but it's also a warning. That we have to always go back to our motivation. And the problem is, can we ever really know our heart? No. I can't be sure what my motivation is. I think my motivation is very generous and giving and thoughtful and for the glory of God. Okay, and there just may be a little bit of this in there. So I have to just let Jesus take care of it, because I can't know my heart. And that's a good prayer. Lord, I don't even know what my heart is on this, but you do know my heart. Would you reveal it to me? So remember, he does know your heart, for all the right reasons. Jesus also possessed the divine attribute of immortality, the inability to die. Think about that. <laughs> Inability to die. They couldn't have killed him if they'd wanted to. He had to give his life up. So that's why he gave up his spirit. It didn't say, and they killed him. It never says they killed him. They crucified him, but they couldn't kill him. We see this indicated near the beginning of John's Gospel when Jesus said to the Jews, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. John 2. John explains that he was not speaking about the temple made with stones in Jerusalem, but he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he'd said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. John 2, 21-22. We must insist, of course, that Jesus really did die. This very passage speaks of the time when he was raised from the dead. But it's also significant that Jesus predicts that he will I didn't bring this, no, this was here. Active role in his own resurrection. I will raise it up. 
Although other scripture passages tell us that God the Father was active in raising Christ from the dead, he also, here he also says he himself is active in his own resurrection. Well, if he's active in his own creation or his own yeah. conception, then why can't he be active in his own resurrection? Can't think of an argument against that. Yeah. But it is shocking because a lot of us know the Father is involved in the resurrection and don't always realize that, oh, by the way, Jesus said also, I'll raise myself up. Wow. Okay. Truly God. Truly God. Jesus claims the power to lay down his life and take it up again in another passage in John's Gospel. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. See, this is why they couldn't kill him. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, I have the power to take it again. This charge I received from my Father, John 10, 17 and 18. Here Jesus speaks of a power that no other human being has had. The power to lay down his own life and the power to take it up again. Once again, it's an indication that Jesus possessed the divine attribute of immortality. Similarly, the author of Hebrews says that Jesus has become a priest, not according to the legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. He was indestructible. They couldn't kill him. Hebrews 7.16 The fact that immortality is a unique characteristic of God alone is seen in 1 Timothy 6.16, which uh, that was the verse I was saying a while ago. Thank you which speaks of God as the one who alone has immortality. So it's laying it out very, very clearly. And another clear attestation to the deity of Christ, the fact that he's counted worthy to be worshipped, something that is true of no other creature, including the angels. So don't worship me, worship only God. Uh, yet scripture says of Christ that God has highly exalted him and bestowed him in the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9, 11. Similarly, God commands the angels to worship Christ, for we read in Hebrews 1, 6, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. John is allowed a glimpse of the worship that occurs in heaven. For he sees thousands and thousands of angels and heavenly creatures around God's throne saying, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation 5.12 And he, then he hears every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all therein saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. In the next verse, 513. Christ is here called the Lamb of the Slain, and he is accorded the universal worship of, offered to God the Father, thus clearly demonstrating his equality in deity. It's a pretty good argument, backing up what we said. Any other questions or thoughts on this concept? no corruption of sin. And this, he carried that, he did that as a man. He didn't do that because he was God. He did that as a man. He had to, which we will be studying soon, to be the propitiating sacrifice. 
He had to, as a man, take it all. So it is beyond human endurance, just physically what he went through. I mean, so, but you're saying he couldn't have been killed. Because there's no corruption of sin, and the wages of sin is death. Okay. And so he's, he's got he's the power of an indestructible <laughs> life. So being a God-man, he can't die, and there's no corruption in him. So remember, there was no sin before Genesis 3. They were, I mean, death. They, were, they, were the, they would have been immortal. So Adam was immortal. And when you read in Romans 5, it's death came because of sin. So Jesus was absent of sin, so there's no death. <laughs> now, there's pain and misery and agony and all of that, but no sin. I mean, no death. But he didn't tap into his deity to do that? He couldn't. He had to be a man that would go through to be the perfect sacrifice. And it does say he, he was unrecognizable that as himself or even as a human. What, what does that mean when it says he was unrecognizable? Being that bad just, yeah, so. He was just turned into hamburger meat. He was so bad. The blood, the loss, the... Everything, skin ripped off, his bones were sticking through. It was horrible, like the worst torture. But, you but he couldn't have died up. from it. Right, but you cleared that up for me because I, I, mean, I thought, how could he walk, how could he go? I think as a, if you're relying only on your humanity, it wouldn't, wouldn't Wait, 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 now relying on his humanity, he would did it in <clears throat> his human nature under the power of the spirits and obedience to the Father. So he was willing to do this suffering for you. Because the sin couldn't kill him. So there was no sin. He had no death. Yeah. He had no death in him. Because the wages of sin is death. Romans 5, it's sin that brings death. So he couldn't die. He had to give up his life. Don't know what that means. But the man died, but they couldn't kill him. Maybe that's what I want to say. They couldn't kill him. He had to choose to give up his life. I wonder even the soldiers and those who hated him, if it was even more affirmation that yes, he is God, because what, yeah. can make, what person could do this? John, John Wayne said, surely this was the son of God. <laughs> In the greatest story ever told, he plays the, the part of the <clears throat> Roman soldier that said, surely this was the son of God. So there were some there. The, the, he was our dad, but clearly it witnessed to the faith, and he believed. It witnessed to this Gentile Roman who was there assisting killing him. And in the dark. Well, I can't say killing him. <laughs> but killing him. Crucifying. I can say crucifying. But crucifying... You know, it did. Why didn't it really minister to a whole lot of the disciples? Because they were there. They ran away, except for John. Yeah, where were they during that time? Pardon? Where were they during that time? Probably the same thing I would have done: hiding, ashamed of yourself, but too terrified to go. Because yeah. to go, you know, all they have to do is grab me and put me up there too. I don't. I don't know. It doesn't. I don't know anything in scripture except so they, they ran they away. There, yeah. Almost they ran away. Wow. So think about this. Okay, this is for some of us, this is a whole new aspect to think about. We're talking about fully God, fully man. But this is a man who did not have sin. Therefore there's no corruption of sin. And it's sin that brings death. So he had to give up his life. We read, no one takes it from me, I give it up on my own. And, but what makes it even more incredible is that at any point, okay, could, could this have happened? If the, well, you, can, you have to be careful of what, know, what could have happened. I know. <coughs> he said, I could bring 10,000 angels. I mean, right. you know, legions of angels. Because he endured it all the way to the cross. Yes. And when we stay propitiation, he had to do the full suffering that propish, that paid for our sacrifice, I mean for our sin. So he didn't suffer more than he needed to or less. 
he had to endure the entire wrath of God for sin. And then he said, it's finished. The entire wrath of God has been poured out on me. Payment, I can redeem my people now. God is just, holy, and righteous, and I've paid for it. That's why when we study propitiation, it is amazing. And it all just fits right into this. Because he had to do all of it. And so it isn't just the death on the cross. It's his entire life of obedience that qualified him to be the propitiating sacrifice that turned God's wrath into favor for us. Another question? Opening your eyes to some y'all. Anybody else have a comment they want to make? All right, because we're not going to start the next one because we were but what I will introduce to you is what we're going to do. Great, difficult question. Did Jesus give up some of his divine attributes while on earth? And we all go, well, intellectually, where is it, you know, in Philippians 2, where it says, and he emptied himself and became a man. So, emptied himself of what? What did he keep? Did he give them up? How does that work? <coughs> so we're going to have to really think because this is really great. And we're going to skip some of it because some of it's a little deep theological explanations that we don't need to, but we're going to do this. So if you want to, go back and read Philippians 2. Again, we just keep going back to it because Philippians 2 describes the incarnation. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to grasp made himself nothing. He emptied himself in some way. That emptying is the word kenosis and huge controversy over what he emptied himself of. Or what did he give up? Because that defines who Jesus Christ is. What he gave up and what he didn't. Anybody? Okay, let's pray. Thank you again. I'm just, in my heart I'm so humbled. I'm so thankful for what you did. Thank you for doing this for us, Jesus. That you would be willing to come to earth in the messy, messy, yucky life we have here. <coughs> Limit yourself into a body when you're the kind of God we... You are God! And you chose to come as a human being. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a great preparation this is for me for Easter. Lord, if we misspoke or misunderstood or said something you didn't want to understand, let it be forgotten. But what you want each woman listening to this to get, bury it deep in her soul, remind her of it, draw her to you, and fertilize it well. Thank you. And we do give you all the glory and honor and praise. Let me see what it said in Revelation. I want to read that. Um, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen.